Welcome to our Democrats Abroad Ohio team event uh, about saving democracy with David Pepper. Um, I just want to remind everyone in the upfront that if you vote in Ohio or you know someone who votes in Ohio, remind them to request their absentee ballot at votefromabroad.org. So with that, I want to introduce our Ohio team. Uh, my name is Angela Fobbs. I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. Our other team members are Karen Lean. She's from Galleon, Mansfield, and Columbus. Nikki Vondervel is from Xenia. Kenton Barnes from Toledo. Jeff Simmons grew up in Cleveland. Born in Cleveland, grew up in Columbus. Christine Anderson is from Chagrin Falls and from Euclid, a suburb of Cleveland. Don Earhart is from Cleveland. Miguel Madrigal is from Columbus and Rebecca Lambers is also from Columbus. And we have our very own uh, Akron native, Art Shankler, uh, with a greeting from Global. Art? You're on mute. There it is. Hi, thanks very much, Angela. It's very kind of you. Uh, I don't know if I'm global, but I'm certainly around the world. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome all of, the, all of you to another Ohio event, and particularly our special guest, uh, David Pepper. I know somebody else will introduce him, but a former chair of the Ohio Democratic Party. I think we, we met once or twice when I was on the ASTC with him as well a few years ago. Uh, it's, as Angela said, I'm a Akron native. I can discuss Akron politics of the 1960s with anyone who's the, which is not that anyone wants to, but anyway, so it's a pleasure, especially this year, as I'm sure others will remind people of the, as Angela just did, two important elections this year. One, to vote against the requirement to increase the uh, uh, approval percentage to make a constitutional amendment. The Republicans would like to make it from 50 to 60%. And the reason why they did that is because there's going to be another measure on the ballot to make a constitutional amendment to preserve the right uh, of women to choose uh, reproductive rights. Uh, that's going to be in November and the Republicans wanna make sure that the threshold for that is as high as it can be, despite the fact that a majority of people in Ohio are in favor of preserving abortion rights in the state. So with that, I'm looking forward to hearing David uh, and I know the rest of you will talk about his new book on saving democracy. A certainly a worthwhile goal and a timely one as we are looking at yet more existential elections. So thanks, I'll turn it back to you, Angela, thanks. And again, welcome to all of you. You're on mute now, you're on mute now. Yeah, I know. Uh, Miguel, you're doing the introduction. I am. Well, thank you all very, very much for being here. My name is Jose Miguel Madrigal. I am a proud Ohio voter proud Buckeye, born, by the way, on the 4th of July, and um, I um, am part of the Ohio State team. So before we actually start, let me remind people that there is a very special election coming up this August, and it is a really well-funded attempt by Ohio Republicans to silence the average citizen's voice. So this is why we all have to vote no this, fall, this coming August. This is why everybody here on the Ohio State team um, needs to make sure that that message gets out there and to every Ohioan in the Democrats Abroad membership. Calling is the most effective way to reach out to our Ohio members around the world and to let them know to vote no in August. But calling costs us money. So besides the time he's spending with us today, David Pepper has very graciously um, decided to contribute five signed copies to raffle off, off to lucky donors of $50 or more. So we will be drawing names after the Q&A session. And uh, you still have half about like half an hour to make your pledge uh, in the link in the chat. So let's do it. Let's make it happen. So we'll be drawing the winners at the end of this program. So if you donate now, and please stick around for all the fun, and let's see if you're the lucky winner to get the your name out of the hat. 
right? So the donation chat, the donation uh, link will be on in the chat. Um, it's democratsabroad.org slash donate. And uh, that's all for now. So on with the program, Karen. Unmute. Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Good. Go ahead. Okay, great. Surprise. So David Pepper, what can I say? Smart kid, did well at Yale, got into politics in Cincinnati, and eventually served as the Ohio Dem Party chair during one of those rough patches when the tide was definitely against Dems. In the aftermath, he's, he's authored four thought-provoking political thrillers and two now must-read nonfictions on politics at the state level. The second one is why we're here today. If you haven't already, you can read David's full bio on the event page where you RSVP'd. But what I wanna say is kind of summarized in a few quick statements. First of all, when I heard him at a panel in the, I think it was a Dems Abroad AGM in 2016, I had to have his book. This guy knows what he's talking about. So I bid more than I could afford in the auction, got the book signed, it's on my shelf over here to my right, and the rest have followed. It's literally can't put them down. Secondly, David's insider experience of state level politics and the folks who live it is pretty hard to beat. So we're gonna hear about that. In the last year, he's turned his talents to raising money via Blue Ohio to run a Dem in every state legislature seat in Ohio. We didn't always do that, but it's going and it's growing. And if we'd done that earlier, we might not be here fighting off issue one today. And finally, David was the Ohio team's numero uno in road to the staffers that count. And that help last year netted us the nearly 100% participation of statewide and congressional candidates for our Meet the Candidates events. In short, the Ohio team loves David Pepper. And we think, if you don't already, that you will too. So, uh, David, you try to live up to that intro. Wow. Mike is yours. Uh, that's going to be hard to live up to, but thank you so much, um, Karen and everyone. Angela, good to see you again uh, from Cincinnati. I mentioned to the folks on the before the call, if you're from Northeast Ohio, uh, I'm in Geauga County at the Punderson Manor, which is an old state park. Um, I happen to be giving a speech later to the Geauga County Women's uh, Democratic Club. And this was the best place to find a place I could talk to you from. So some of you may know this place. It's, it's allegedly a haunted house and I'm in the library upstairs. So if it's haunted, this may be the place where it is, but um, it's good to be with all of you. Um, I, I don't know if you all have, um, which of you have been on a prior call with me, so I hope I'm not redundant, but I want to talk a little bit about both books. Um, I sort of, without meaning to, Karen, started a project a couple years ago when I wrote Laboratories of Autocracy, because the book Laboratories of Autocracy was, was my very, um, frantic way to try and explain to people around the country, and, and, and in this case around the world, what the true assault on democracy looked like as we were living it in Ohio. And my worry has been that too few people actually understand what it really is. They watch Marjorie Taylor Greene and Donald Trump and think that's sort of the net total of it when I think we, we in Ohio know that's actually just the surface level of it. But then I got so much feedback from the first book, so concerned about what I wrote and people so eager to know what to do that it forced me to write the second book which I just put out called Saving Democracy, a user's manual for every American, which explains how everybody can play a role. Um, so I wanna talk through both of those a little bit. Um, I won't go through great detail on the first one, uh, but I wanna walk through sort of an overarching view. If you haven't heard me before, hopefully it's new. If you have it, hopefully it's just sort of a reviewer. Um, let me walk through this real quick. Can everyone see this? So. Again, I, I don't remember exactly when we talked. This was something that kind of occurred to me. Some of you have maybe have seen this, but but the re I present this this basic slide and I open the new book with this because I think once we see the battle for democracy the right way, it becomes very clear what we should be doing at a 30,000 foot level and what we should be doing at the individual level. And this slide basically walks through my, my uh, concern that for too long until very recently, the, the democratic side of politics in America, and frankly, more than Democrats, independents, mainstream media, et cetera, 
have basically seen the American battle of politics as this sort of single battle between red and blue. You know, we got a red team, we got a blue team, and they're each fighting the same battle. And, and it's sort of one battle. And I actually, the more I wrote and thought and talked to groups like this, I thought, you know, that's actually too narrow a way to view the battle. The battle really is, uh, the, the two battles that each side is fighting are, are so different. I think we're better off seeing them as two separate battles. And, and understanding not just our battle, but the other side's battle is, a, is maybe the key step to doing better than we've been doing. Uh, so what are the two battles when I describe this that I, that I mean? Um, the side on the left, um, let's say mostly Democrats, but independents, some moderate Republicans, the media, this side has, has been fighting a battle for years that I think is very easily summed up as, you know, we try and win elections. And, and, and why do we do that? Well, one, we believe in democracy, but we also have been confident that democracy is more or less intact, don't we? Or at least we thought that for a long time until very recently. Uh, we sort of take it for granted. You know, we're America, like mom, apple pie, and baseball, we're a democracy. And I think this side, since the 60s in particular, with the Voting Rights Act, has, has really been fighting its political battle with this assumption that I think we now can agree was a little bit optimistic, the democracy is just there, there, um, you know, in a stable way. This side on the left also, uh, I think, um, you know, confidently and correctly uh, views that its main issues in politics are actually pretty mainstream and actually quite popular. You know, everything from Roe v. Wade, a woman's right to choose, to common sense gun reform, to collective bargaining, to public schools, to you know, don't ban books. I mean, this side understands, and it's correct to do so, that most of the broader health care, you name it, a middle-class based economy versus trickle down. This side actually comes to the battle of politics, not just thinking that democracy is stable, but thinking, well, our views are pretty popular. We're pretty mainstream. If we simply say what we're for, we can win. And we will win. And this side, therefore, chooses a battle of hey, let's go win elections on the stable democracy by asserting the positions that we know are quite popular. Let's go win some elections saying what we're for. And this side, quite quickly, because federal power has led to so much of our best progress, and because in many ways it's the biggest shortcut to victory, this side quickly focuses on swing states in federal years to win federal majorities, doesn't it? And when this side wins those federal battles, in Ohio's benefited from this for some time being a swing state, when this side wins its federal majorities for the House, the Senate, and the Electoral College of President, this side celebrates like it's just won the entire battle, doesn't it? We can all remember 08 when, when Obama won Ohio and that Chicago, that amazing Chicago event. We all celebrated. We just won it all, hadn't we? Or 20 when Trump lost to Biden. Huge win. We celebrated like we'd won the whole battle for democracy. And the problem with that celebration is that we, we won it all is we think that because we actually haven't come to terms with what the other side's battle is. We may have won our battle, but did we win their battle or the way they fight their battle? And once you take a look at their battle, the answer is not quite. In fact, not at all. What's the side on the right's battle? Not just the right of the slide, but let's say the far right. This isn't every Republican, but it's clearly a, a big chunk at this point. The side on the right has two opposite assumptions to what I've just described. The first assumption is democracy isn't automatically intact and stable. And guess what? They're right about that. Uh, we see it in Hungary. We've seen it in Russia. We've seen it in our own history. It's what got us Jim Crow. Democracy can be subverted. It happens all the time. It's not automatically intact. To think it is is frankly naive and ahistoric. Uh, it's sort of a privileged post-60s view that we thought that. Uh, number two, this side, unlike the side on the left, actually understands that their viewpoint in politics, most of their agenda is not popular, but unpopular. In many cases, toxically unpopular. Abortion bans, no exception. So that 10 year old Ohio rape victim had to go to Indiana, for example. That's something that 5% of Ohioans probably thought was, was the right thing. Most dramatically disagree with that. 60% of Ohioans are pro-choice more generally. Uh, you know, no gun regulations at all. That's not popular. That's not popular among gun owners. Trickle on economics, so most people are left out. That's not popular. Getting rid of Social Security, on and on and on. 
they know that their viewpoint is generally not popular. And if you watch closely, you see it when after Dobbs, Lindsey Graham wanted to bring forward an abortion ban nationally. Mitch McConnell told him not to bring it up because he knew that would not do, a, be, do the very well in the Senate race. Um, they shouted down Joe Biden in the State of the Union when he brought up Social Security because they know that he's bringing up something that's really popular. So this side, understanding that democracy can be subverted, but understanding that its viewpoints are unpopular, actually can't, and they know this, if they simply adopted the side on the left strategy, well, let's just go win elections saying what we're for, guess what? They know they would lose. They know that Kansas special referendum, special election last August would be their fate everywhere. So this side doesn't choose to run elections in a fair playing field in swing states like we do. They want to win those elections, but that would be a losing battle for them, and they know it over time. So what's their end game, their battle, as this says, is their, their battles over democracy itself. But it's more specific than it's how do you undermine democracy sufficiently and enough to put into place a minority worldview over time that would otherwise lose in a fair democracy? That's their battle. Now, that, that sounds a little bit you know, intense to accuse someone of that, but the truth is they don't even hide it. And you all know this because you're, you're over there, a lot of you in Europe. I mean, CPAC has its conferences in Hungary, for goodness sakes, to study that type of approach. Then they invite Orban back to Texas to celebrate what he's doing. They're not hiding this. Peter Thiel, who helped J.D. Vance win here, he literally wrote the words that he thinks democracy is inconsistent with freedom, by which he meant his economic freedom. They're not hiding that this is sort of their, their mission. But once they decide that's their mission, and this is a lot of what the first book's about and some of the second book, once they've decided that's their mission, guess what? They have to choose a very different battle plan than winning swing states in federal years. That's a losing battle plan. What do they do? What have they decided? What have they figured out? The single best place for them to achieve the goal of subverting democracy enough to lock in a minority worldview are what? What I call laboratories of autocracy. It's the state house is stupid. State houses turn out to be the single best place for them to lock in a minority worldview over time to accomplish this very toxic agenda I just talked about. Why state houses? I won't go through this in great detail. A lot of you already heard me say this. One, they control every single issue that we care about and they care about. Economy, healthcare, education, energy, but also, does a woman have a right to choose? What's taught in schools? Uh, how do guns regulate it, if at all, et cetera, et cetera. So through state houses, they can get almost their entire agenda done. Mitch McConnell didn't say don't do an international abortion ban in Lindsey Graham because he didn't want it done. He knew they could do it through state houses, which is what's happening. But number two, state house is even better than the substantive power. They control democracy itself. The rules of who votes, when they vote, how they vote, give them the opportunity to shape the electorate. And if you're in the minority, that's a really important power, because if you can, let's say, kneecap the Obama coalition, you can actually really help yourself win a close state like Ohio by purging and suppressing and adding voter ID, et cetera, to give yourself a better chance. But number two, they also have the power to gerrymander. We've seen this so painfully in Ohio. And that gives you either the power in the right hands of drawing a representative democracy where everyone's accountable or to rig the whole damn thing so that no one's accountable and that you're in power no matter what you do. And that's what they do in states like Ohio. Uh, I go through in the books in great detail how much they've rigged um, democracy, not only so that they're often in a majority that the voters don't agree with, but even more so, and I'll go through this in a, a later slide uh, from the second book, they've created a system where almost not a single one of them ever faces accountability, ever faces a real election. And with that lack of accountability, the incentives of these places get all screwed up real quick. But if you're on the far right, that's what you want. The incentives in these state houses where everything's so gerrymandered and half of them aren't even opposed are so intense in the exact opposite direction of what we would want in a good democracy. One, because you only worry about the next primary, not the general, you have an incentive to be an extremist as opposed to mainstream. And that's why you see these places get more and more extreme. That's the only incentive they know. You also have an incentive not to worry about the people back home because they don't, they don't really get a choice anyway, but you have an incentive to serve the, the special interests who are in your state house. You go to bat helping First Energy or that for-profit school, even if that means the people back home pay a price for whatever you gave those private interests. You also have an incentive, of course, to keep attacking democracy itself because being an extremist, giving away public goods to private players would get you knocked out of any close election. So, of course, you need to keep gerrymandering and keep suppressing the vote. Well, if you are 
if you are pushing through this toxic agenda, what I've just described the incentive systems in these state houses being, it turns out they're the perfect place to do all this. Because in states like Ohio and Tennessee and Florida and, and Missouri, you name it, they are incentivized to do extreme things that take public things and give them the private. That's how they get ahead. And, and so I go through all this to basically say, um, you know, go back to this slide. If the people on the left continue to fight a battle over swing states in federal years and the side of the right fights for state power wherever they can gain it, not just swing states. And then whenever they win, they gerrymander these places. They suppress the vote of the other side. They lock in their extremist agenda, but no one can stop them because they've suppressed and gerrymandered the place. And they keep doing what they're doing while the side on the left goes for federal swing states. Over time, who's going to win that battle if they each do the same thing again and again? Clearly, the side on the right is, as I go through in the second book, it's like a soccer game where one team's always on offense. And often the team, the other team, frankly, isn't even on defense, not even challenging these extremists in half these states. So the takeaway point of the first and second book is we got to get on offense. We got to reframe the battle and see that we're in a battle for democracy itself. Once we see that we're in a battle for democracy itself, the same battle they're in, several things become very clear. I'll go through this quickly because I want to get to questions. One, once you see you're in a battle for democracy itself, you realize that this is a long battle. It's not just about every federal cycle. It's on and on and on. It's about school board races and even in odd years. It's about state house races in odd years. I'm sorry, even years, but midterms. We can no longer afford to simply view this as a battle, you know, that's just this federal cycle. And once it, it's the same battle that John Lewis was in. It's a long battle. A lot of it's outside of elections, too, by the way. It's the same battle the suffragists were in. And that means once you see it that way, the truth is, I hope it inspires because it means you can be making progress all the time, even in tough years like we've had in Ohio. We won the Ohio Supreme Court three out of four seats, even when we lost uh, Trump, lost to Biden. So we made progress. Unfortunately, we had a setback last November. But if you have the right mindset, even in tough years, you're making progress as long as you see it as a long game. My best example of someone doing that is uh, a friend of mine, Stacey Abrams. Stacey saw the battle for Georgia's democracy as a long game. She didn't give up every time they were read. She kept fighting. She kept empowering voters, fighting suppression. She ran herself, et cetera, et cetera. And all of a sudden we see in 2020 the result of someone who played a long game for Georgia's democracy. That's how we need to see the battle. Once you see the battle for democracy, you realize this federal two-year up and down crazy cycle mindset is a losing mindset. It's a long battle. Number two, and, and those of you who are from other states, I hope will agree with this. Once you see your battle for democracy itself, you better realize this is more than just a few swing states for the federal election purposes. We are really hurting this country when we decide as Democrats that we only battle in swing states as opposed to fighting for democracy in all states. Uh, sometimes that means you're not winning in places you might win. You know, the Kansas referendum shows you that Kansas is not nearly as right wing as their legislature. So you might you might win in places you wouldn't otherwise win. But even if you don't win, being in the battle means you bring accountability and some moderation. Stepping out of these battles completely like we've done because some state isn't a federal swing state is allowing extremism to run amok with no accountability. And that's why states like Iowa and Indiana and Missouri that voted not too long ago for Democrats, including Obama and Clinton, now look insane. We're not even in these places putting up a fight because they don't meet our formula of a swing state. My attitude is we should be fighting either way because we care about democracy everywhere. And since I wrote the first book, I've talked to all these states. I was in Oklahoma a couple of weeks ago. It, it's just wrong that we're letting these states sort of go by the wayside simply because they somehow don't add up to the electoral college numbers we need. We are really allowing this extremism to go unchecked when we take ourselves out of all these places. Number three, in Ohio, in states, same story. We can no longer allow dozens of extremists in each of these state houses to themselves be uh, run without opposition. And we're allowing that to happen as well. I'll go through it in a second, but uh, I go through the second book. We have to run everywhere, folks. We got to run in the most rural parts of Ohio and suburban parts and our cities. And when, and when, when their front line attacking democracy is in state houses, and many of the most extreme people are in rural parts of these states, when we simply don't run against them, we reward what they're doing. We have to start to bring accountability back. And there are ways to do it, partly because their results are so poor 
because their incentive structure is screwed up. If you ran against some of these places, you'd have a lot to say about rural schools falling apart or streets falling apart or towns falling apart. But when we're not there, we don't even say those things. And so they run, they run amok with their extremism. And that's where most of the advance is taking. It's much bigger than Donald Trump. You probably all saw the tape about him in that meeting. Maybe you saw this. I, 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 this is all especially relevant now. This is so much bigger than Trump. And we make a mistake when we equate the attack on democracy is simply Trump. This began before him. If he were locked up tomorrow, it would continue in every way it's happening now, except for some of his crazy things. Frank LaRose would still be banning drop boxes. They'd still be gerrymandering. They'd still be suppressing. The attack on democracy began before Trump. It will, it will continue after he's gone. And when we, when we equate it to Trump, we make a big mistake because for a lot of reasons, but one is we end up providing cover to people like Frank LaRose who don't seem or act like Donald Trump, but truthfully are doing more damage to democracy in Ohio than Donald Trump ever has. And so we have to make sure that we see this as about what side are you on, not Trump or no Trump? Are you on the side of democracy or not? That's what matters. And the last thing, and this took me to my second book, once people realize that the front line of democracy isn't a few swing states and isn't the courtroom in Florida where Donald Trump's gonna be tried, but it's actually every state all the time my hope is, and because they see the stakes are democracy itself, my hope is people see that versus watching TV and thinking the battle is some far away place somewhere, everyone realizes, oh my God, the battle is in my backyard. The battle is in that state house seat that no one challenged in the last couple of elections. It's in the city like Cleveland where so many voters have been suppressed. It's at the local school board where they're trying to ban books. That's all the battle. And my hope is, although that's sobering, it also is empowering people see that there's so much more they can do in that battle than they ever do. And that's really what the second book is all about. And, and I got a lot of feedback from the first book, but you'll, you won't be surprised that after hearing all the gloom and doom I just walked through, the most common feedback I got was, okay, that's so frustrating. What can we do about it beyond what you wrote in the first book? So that's when I wrote the second book. And the second book is truly a, um, a user's manual. It is trying to show people how they can in their world, in their life, in everything they are currently doing, how they can lift democracy. And I'll go through a couple slides on this and then, and go to, um, and then go to Q and A. A uh, couple things. One, I mentioned the soccer game. This is from the second book. When I say they're always on offense, this is what I mean. Think about their team. Their forwards in that soccer game are a bunch of state houses kicking the ball again and again and again. There's the Mississippi, MS. They kicked the ball and scored on Dobbs, didn't they? And there's Tennessee, that crazy state house that kicked out the two Justins. And there's Ohio kicking away nonstop. And, and, and not only are we not on offense in most of these places, the truth is, and I go through this in the book in great detail, we're not even on defense. These are the states in 22 and a few in 21, but mostly 22, these are how many of the seats in these types of state houses that they are shooting from that we didn't even oppose. And you'll see, it's not five or 10%, folks. It's 50% almost of the Tennessee state house, those Republicans. Ohio, I don't like that we're at 19%, but actually we're pretty low in the grand scheme of things. In Florida, 31%. In Texas, 27%. I was with, I was with Wendy Davis the other day who said it is so hard to run statewide when you're trying to cover for dozens of districts where no one's even running. And so what happens when you have these systems with no accountability is those Tennessee Republicans who kicked out the two Justins or the crazy ones pushing for this thing in Ohio, they do the most extreme and toxic things and they don't even face elections. Of course, they're going to get worse. It, it rewards them. They only worry about the next primary. They cease being public servants almost entirely. And so when I say it's a soccer game, we're, we're not on offense. We're often not even on defense. And the answer when they score a goal from our side is too often, well, if we only elected more U.S. senators, we could stop them. That'd be like looking at this, this field I have in front of you and demanding that we have a better goalie, as if that would solve it, versus, versus saying, oh, thank you so much, versus trying to block the shots where they're taken. We need to get in these games and block shots where they're taken, and that means running everywhere. And I go through in the second book in great detail how all of us can play a role in encouraging 
incentivizing, inspiring people to run everywhere and valuing people running everywhere, something we don't do right now nearly too much. One other thing I'll point out in, in the second book, and then I'm, I'm, I'll be finished. I greatly worry that we also have a real problem right now. And I go through this in the second book. We are too often only engaging the, the, the electorate that is still around after all the voter suppression. If you, if, you, if you were in Ohio in the final weeks of any campaign and you start door knocking, you will find yourself knocking on the doors of the most reliable voters, won't you? And when you think about that for a second, when you know that Franklin Rose and that state house have been purging voters nonstop who are less regular voters and that there are other less regular voters out there. And then you think about the fact that we only talk to the most repeated voters on the right, we are accepting the results of their suppression as the new electorate. And that's crazy when you think about it. That's allowing them to win. Their goal is to shrink the electorate to have a majority that's their majority by getting rid of key parts of our majority. And when we accept the results of that by only talking to people that are regular voters, we are giving them that. And so I walk through in great detail how we have to go from this slide up to uh, incorporate all of that block on the right. And that's when I go through this in great detail. I don't have time to go through it here, but, I'll go, but I do it in the book. Why do I emphasize in my second book, use your footprint as much as you can? Because I think it's in all the less political things we do beyond our politics that we often will get to the suppressed electorate. It's in our churches. It's in nonprofits. It's are you the volunteer of a food bank or a free store? Do you know the mayor of Cleveland or Cincinnati? Could you ask them to make sure that every time someone walks through that public health clinic, they're asked if they're registered, they're asked if they have the voter ID they need. That's, these are the very people being suppressed. We, we talk to them in so many ways every day in different ways, but very rarely do we ask them in those conversations if they're part of our democracy. And then we put our political hat we knock on doors for three weeks to go, and we only talk to the people who are regular voters. And so I go through in the book how we all can play. If you take out your, and you'll, you'll like this in the book, and I'll share a link uh, for you in the chat in a second. I, I have worksheets saying to people, look at your footprint and figure out in your footprint what are all the ways you can interact with voters. And, and start thinking about all the different things you could be doing beyond your political group to engage with voters that we know have been taken out of the electorate purposely <laughs> in Ohio. And that's really what this footprint model. So I also have a website where I let people download and print this thing out. We need all of us, you know, the scale, I'll close with this. The scale of the attack on democracy is enormous. It's full time, it's billions of dollars. Frank LaRose is all he does. And too often we are on a very, our push for democracy, the scale is far too small. The way we make our scale big and successful is if the millions of us who care about democracy start thinking about all the ways we can lift it and not only the few ways that we currently apply ourselves to campaign. So with that, I will stop talking. Um, one other thing I'll say, though, is I am very optimistic that if we do everything I'm talking about in these books, we can actually have a very good next couple of years. You remember what I said, their extremism, they're trying to hide it. Mitch McConnell's trying to hide it. Mike DeWine erased his website of all references to his lifelong attempt to ban abortion in Ohio in um, last fall. They know it's unpopular, but after Dobbs, it's not hidden anymore, is it? It's not hidden. Um, Marjorie Taylor Greene is the face of Congress. It's not hidden. The Trump DeSantis primary, it's not hidden. So if we are smart enough to say their extremism is clear from the federal to Congress to state house, and we build up and run everywhere this time and not just worry about the presidential race and support everywhere. I think we can have a, you know, we have a little winning streak going. November 22, we picked up some state houses. We stopped secretaries of state running for election denier. April of this year, we won the Wisconsin Supreme Court race. We'll talk about it. Let's go win issue one this August. Let's go win the reproductive rights uh, referendum this November. And that's roll into November of next year, running in every district. When their extremism is exposed as it is, I think it opens up a big opportunity to put together a winning streak for democracy. So with that, I will stop talking. would love to open to questions, and I'm happy to address the issue one situation on the ground when people ask about it. Thanks, everybody. Wow, David. 
Um, I just ordered the book while you were talking because yeah. it really is a roadmap and I definitely want to use it. Um, Thank you. We're, we're all ready to take questions. And uh, if you have a question, please type star star hand up in the chat. Uh, our first question is from Karen Lee. Um, Karen, do you want to ask your question? Yes. And I'm going to skip down to one that um, we didn't cover too heavily. Um, wait a second. We are expecting several decisions yet from the Supreme Court, including one that came out today um, on the independent state legislature theory. Um, you touched on it. I don't think you touched on it that heavily, but um, they've, they've struck it down for the moment, I think. Could you expand yeah. on that a little bit more? What is this, the independent state legislature theory? And if it were to pass, what impact would that have on elections like even next year? Well, breaking news, it was thoroughly defeated, as I thought it might be. By the way, I'm going to give you one other thing, one other resource. So that's the link to my footprint. I do a Substack newsletter about three or four days a week. I'll send one out on, on this decision in the coming hours. If you want to subscribe to my Substack, it's free. It's written right here. If you care about all these issues, I think you'll find um, find it interesting. So this Moore v. Harper independent state legislative theory, and there was an Ohio tie, was basically an attempt. So if you go back to what I said about state houses, that's their front line. That's how they're attacking democracy. And the reason they can successfully attack democracy there and pass extremism is because they feel no accountability in those state houses. They're gerrymandered so the people can't stop them. Um, they largely run roughshod over cowards like Mike DeWine so the governor doesn't stop them. But one of their two major threats to them right now in this country. One is the citizens through constitutional amendments. That's why they're trying to raise the threshold to 60%. They don't like accountability. So whatever they can erode the accountability that might hold them accountable, they try and do so. That's why issue one is so important. They are trying to keep the citizens from overturning what they do. The second threat to out of control state houses are state Supreme Courts. And this Moore v. Harper theory was an attempt to get the US Supreme Court to agree to this completely lawless theory that Ohio Supreme Court and other courts don't even have the jurisdiction to review what legislatures do when it comes to election rules, gerrymandering, and other things. It was a rogue theory. Can you imagine the state? I mean, they're already crazy enough saying that, oh, it's an election issue. Sorry, you can't even, the state doesn't, court doesn't even have any jurisdiction to review what you do. Literally, that's the end of the rule of law in, in most states. Well, today, and I just, I'll write about this. You'll get, if you sign for the sub you'll see this. I'm not shocked by it. It was such a crazy theory, so lawless that the court, Robert's writing the opinion, and I'm not surprised by Roberts. The one, the one justice that surprised me and impressed me is Amy Coney Barrett sided with the six majority justices who said, sorry, that theory is insane. We're not going to let state houses be totally unmoored from their own state constitutions and the law. So that was a very good and big day for, um, for democracy. Now, sadly, in Ohio and in North Carolina, the delay has allowed them to get to a friendly court. So the very near-term consequences, when we have a court now, this is true of issue one also, our court right now is basically gonna do whatever the legislature wants. So it doesn't save us. It doesn't save North Carolina where this case came from, but as a big picture matter, it saves the country from what would have been a truly lawless era as state houses already too powerful would have gained one more sort of shield against accountability. Uh, our next question. question? Our hey, next I see question. Katie Solans here. Hey, Katie, good to see you. Our next question is from Art. Hi, sorry. Uh, yeah, speaking of uh, court, Supreme Court decisions uh, and gerrymandering, uh, we, we had our door knock in D.C. a couple of weeks ago, and one of the congressmen there mentioned the, uh, the Supreme Court decision overruling uh, uh, racial gerrymandering. Uh, and he estimated that that would return at least four to six seats to the Democrats in 2024 if they if they actually implement what what the court said. Is is, is 
Do you have a view on that? And is that going to have an yeah. impact? I know the redistricting in Ohio was back and forth and yada. yada. Is, is that going to have any impact on Ohio as well? Uh, no, but I'll just say I, it's a huge win and one that I um, I worried and I, te I teach this at law school and I worried and I'm, I'll send you my sub stack on that one just for people who are interested. I worried that... I thought that the the current today's case, I thought that was a bridge too far. I mean, that, it was truly insane. And I thought that the court wouldn't go for that. But often the court works in twos where it gives us a win on one that seems too far, then gives us a bad loss that we often don't see as bad because we're so excited about the win. So this case you talked about out of Alabama was a surprise. This would have been the last this would have gotten rid of the last protection against gerrymandering, which is racially discriminatory gerrymandering. They, they basically last year in Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and even in Tennessee, they split up majority black districts into multiple districts. When uh, uh, they split the, the black community of these districts so that it went from in Alabama, they could have had two districts that were majority minority and they only had one. And decades of precedent said, you are vi violating the Voting Rights Act when you do that. And I thought for sure, given what Roberts has done for his whole time there and Kavanaugh, they would actually go along with Alabama's argument, which is, oh, that's not really the rules anymore. But to, again, to their credit, they actually said, oh, we're still going to apply the same rule. And for that reason, Alabama, Georgia, and Louisiana, it, it all come down to some to timing. I'm sure they'll try and delay this as much as they can should have at least one more seat, at least one more each state going into next year, and potentially North Carolina as well, um, maybe other places. So not only does it lead to, because basically all those states had violated this rule, and the Supreme Court has suspended the court cases, allowing the illegal seats to be seats in this Congress. So about half of the majority in theory, is wiped out by this decision. Um, but even more than that, they would have, if they had won that case, they would have, I think, gone back and re gerrymandered a bunch of other states saying, oh, we're allowed to now split up black communities into little pieces. So not it's kind of like the Moore v. Harper one. Not only does it in the near term bring back seats into the fray for 24, but it averts what would have been a really cynical new process of truly dividing up communities of color. On your question about Ohio, it really, we only really have, believe it or not, one truly majority minority, uh, maybe two, but generally one in Cleveland. Um, and none of those places would you think you would have multiple majority minority districts. So it really doesn't, I don't think, and maybe there's someone who can show that I'm wrong about this. This was not a ground by which they were suing over the Ohio gerrymandering. So it likely doesn't free up or add potentially more seats between in this small room my worry is actually the opposite and i'm friends with greg landsman amelia sykes you should have them on some of your calls wonderful new congress people my worry is this is going to up the pressure on kevin mccarthy yes. to actually say well we just lost three or four seats in other states we've got to go to our horrible senator here matt huffman and we have to tell him we need another seat out of Ohio. So my worry is they may try and compensate for losing these seats in these other states by drawing Amelia a, a really tough district or trying to uh, you know, tear up Greg Landsman's district. So I hope that doesn't happen, but that could be the, the one unfortunate consequence is they'll feel some pressure to get rid of one or two of the seats we now have in Ohio. But, it, but overall, another, I mean, we were two for two. And with this Supreme Court, I will take that in a huge way. Both of these were true threats to fair districting go forward in democracy. And today's case made it two for two on those cases, which is huge. Our next question is from Christina. Uh, Hi, um, I asked this question once before uh, on, a, on an Ohio call. It's again about gerrymandering. I, I I thought the problem was solved in 2018 when they put it on the ballot and we all, I'm from Cuyahoga County, it was passed through the state that they would be a 
uh, bipartisan coalition that drew the gerrymandering maps. And that was supposed to go into effect, if I recall correctly, in 2020. That was just thrown out the door. So they actually threw out of the door what the Ohio voters have voted right. upon. Yeah, I mean, here's the, they, we have lived in Ohio what this Moore v. Harper case would have done everywhere. The legislature broke the law and the legislature didn't care what the court said. And they broke it for long enough. By the way, I helped push those things. So this is, I hear the pain in your voice. I feel the pain every day of this. They got away with breaking the law. And they broke the law for so long that, you know, this crazy judge Cannon in, in Florida that's helping Trump. Well, we essentially had a very Trumpy court in, in Ohio say to them, well, you've broken the law for so long, we have to impose one of the maps that violates the Constitution. So a federal court rewarded them for breaking the law. Um, I will say, um, I was on the phone this morning with Justice O'Connor, the Chief Justice, who had to step aside because of the age limitation. We are going to bring back another, hopefully, if, if it's viable and there's support for it, another redistricting amendment, which hopefully adds some teeth so they don't break the law. But I, I, I do agree, it's very frustrating. And just so it's clear, going back to issue one. So issue one, you all know the issue one, I hope. There's a, there's a current effort to get on the ballot this November uh, a, a protection for abortion access on Ohio's constitution, just like Kansas. Because the legislature knows that it would succeed, they're trying to raise the threshold to pass an amendment in Const uh, the Constitution of Ohio to 60%. Going back to your frustration, Christina, again, they broke the law to do this. They banned only a few months ago special elections in August, but they needed to have a special election in August to raise the threshold to 60% to get ahead of the referendum on abortion in November. And so even though they banned special elections in August, they have literally passed a resolution demanding a special election in August in the same in the current Ohio Supreme Court ruled last week that we are now supposed to have and are going to have an election in August that violates Ohio law. So I just did a video on this today. I do these little whiteboard videos. We are literally living in a state that has that, that doesn't have a rule of law. And I hate to say it, but that's that's a, that's us. And I say to people all the time, whatever countries you are in, if we saw the countries you are in behaving like Ohio, we as Americans would say, what the hell's wrong with that country? It has no rule of law. In Ohio, that's our status. And one reason the issue one is so important is not only to keep the, the threshold 50%, not only preserve majority rule, it's to say to all these bozos, the governor, the Supreme Court, and the legislature who are all in on it, we want a rule of law in Ohio, and we are going to punish you because you keep violating that. But yeah, the gerrymandering was totally against the rule of law. And when the Supreme Court kind of let them get away with it, it undermined it. And yet again, and by the way, once you have lawlessness, it builds on lawlessness. So a, a current legislature that is in seats that violate the Ohio Constitution is now forcing an illegal election this August that violates their own law. It's like a domino effect. And once they feel no accountability, it keeps going. So this issue one is one of our opportunities to say, we see it, we're, you know, I, I won't swear, but we're deeply disturbed about it. And that's one reason we have to crush this thing. Yeah, I'm glad you answered the way you did because the last time I asked that question, they said I was being too pessimistic. <laughs> and no, it's true. I, it is, I feel like, Oh my God, they're not even following the law at all. They aren't, and, and we need to call it out. And I'm a lawyer, so I always worry about um, someone's going to say, "Well, you know, you might you might lose your bar stuff." Like I, I, we have to call it out. This legislature, and that's why I say Moore v. Harper. It would have basically this case today. We've been living what it's like because we have a we have a state where our legislature has ignored courts for two years and has broken the law. And what Moore v. Harper just said to the country is actually you shouldn't have that. We've been stuck with it. And now, unfortunately, we have an Ohio Supreme Court that will go along with it, which is terrible. This decision the other day, again, on my sub stack, I wrote about it. This decision the other day where they allowed the special election to go forward is absolutely horrific. And I include, by the way, I'll, I'll add this if you're interested. I, I um the dissents by if you may know these folks, uh, Justice Bruner and Justice um, Justice Bruner and Justice uh, Darnley, 
are so strong calling out. I mean, I'll share this with you guys, calling out just how lawless the decision by the Ohio Supreme Court was allowing an election on a day that the same state house had made illegal to have that election. But that's what we're living right now in Ohio. Yeah, and then we, we have a Supreme Court justice is the son of the governor, and he re all constantly refuses to recuse himself. Yeah, that terrible. He's the swing justice. By the way, I used to be on city council and county commission with him. That may mean that may explain why I'm extra tough on him. I know him very well, and he's smart enough to know all this is ridiculous. It, the, the wine family, honestly, has truly corrupted this the, the system, of the rule of law in Ohio. Not only through justice to wine, not recusing, including on those gerrymandering cases when his dad was literally named defendant, which in the law requires recusal. It's not even discretionary, but in in the in, in an appointment he made only months ago to a vacancy on the Supreme Court, he named the county prosecutor of Hamilton County, who's an old family friend. They've been trading favors for years. So as I go through in this whiteboard I did just today, if you're on Twitter, you'll see it. The rule of law, and you would see this in other countries, the rule of law fades very quickly when all three branches of government, which are supposed to be checks and balances, all agree at the same time to not respect the rule of law. And that's what's happening in Ohio as we speak. Wow. <laughs> you but me don't be pessimistic. But the, the lesson is don't quit. But, and this is why I wrote this new book. We can fight back. They want us to quit. They want us to stop running. When they do all this, it's why we have to run harder. It's why we have to run everywhere. It's we got we got to really prioritize. By the way, everything I just said. If we keep our two justices who are up in twenty, don't don't let anyone say that twenty four is only about Sherrod Brown. There are three justice races up in November twenty four. Two wonderful incumbents, Donnelly and Stewart, and one open seat. That tainted county prosecutor I mentioned. If we retain our two and win that one, we win the court back. So all the frustration, channel it into moving forward. Because like that case out of Alabama, which we were not supposed to win, you never know where you're going to surprise people win. And I think in 24, with all that's happening, who knows if we might sneak up and surprise them. We were never supposed to win the three out of four Supreme Court races. We, we, ran, we won when I was chair in 18 and 20. We totally snuck up on them, and I hope we can do it again. All right, our next question is from Jeff. Hey, David, um, I love what you said about putting a defender on the ball <laughs> everywhere all the time. Um, and the state team, uh, we talk about a kind of a dream scenario. We call it the 88 county uh, strategy. Um, and we'd love to see that number of, uh, go from 19% unopposed uh, to 0%. To uh, my question is about what can we do to influence that? You know, I also like the idea about a footprint, and there's a lot of people you know, in all of our lives around in our orbit that we can get more contact with. But for that, we need candidates, and frankly, we need to um, get support for that from, uh, uh, from the state party, from the party, from the powers that be. Great <laughs> question. I go through this in great detail in the new book because it's... it's um, it's such a fundamental question. And so I'll say it this way. Um, we do not have an infrastructure. This is true of the Nash. And I was, I was a Democratic chair. I'm close friends with Jamie Harrison. I don't say this to criticize, but it is to observe. We do not have an infrastructure on our side that values running everywhere. We just don't. We value running for federal seats and swing areas. And so we accept this as business as usual. We think, well, since this doesn't impact our federal math, this is okay. And my point is obviously to say, no, it's not okay. It's a disaster. How do we go from this and thinking this is okay? And that if you spent, and but once, by the way, once we think this is okay, there's sort of a dominant mindset. Well, if you run for any of these seats in rural Texas, you're wasting money because you're taking away from our federal battle. And we have to reject that and say, no, running everywhere is so important. We're going to value it. We're going to, for example, this is, this is my hypothetical Amy McGrath fundraising chart. I don't fault Amy McGrath for raising a lot of money. Good for her. But all of us, yeah, that, that's what a candidate's supposed to do. But if you took just a sliver of her fundraising, let's call that $100 million, and you push it over, you would fully fund dozens and dozens of state house races that weren't even contested last time. And by doing that, you are actually making a stronger push for democracy than whatever extra TV she bought with that slice that we cut out. 
So we have to literally create a mindset of that, that we need to value fighting for democracy everywhere. And that starts with recruiting in every district. And when someone steps up, I don't care if it's the 99th hardest, the, the first and most difficult district to run in, we tell those people, thank God you're running, you're a patriot, your public service began the day you started running, not only if you win, and we wrap them with support all the way through, not as much as you know a Senate candidate or even a swing state house candidate, but we have to show that we value them running. In one very specific way, I'll put a link up here. I, I, I didn't plan on doing this, but since he asked the question, I'll mention it. I started, so we need to find mechanisms that allow this slide to happen seamlessly. The reason people give to Amy McGrath is they know they don't like Mitch McConnell, so they're thinking about the race is important. And they know to go to her website, don't they? Because it's easy. We need to create a seamless way for people to also value democracy in a more so complicated way and help. And I don't have the slide here, but it's in the book. I, some of you may have heard of this. I created something using a model out of Missouri called Blue Ohio. In Blue Ohio, I'm gonna put a link to it up here. Blue Ohio is an organization I created where we crowdfund support for the toughest districts in Ohio. I literally started a year ago and said, is anyone willing to put in 10 or 15 bucks a month if I tell you that money, won't 100% of that money will go to districts that are too often completely underfunded or not competed in at all. And you'll be glad to know that within five months, I had more than 1,100 people putting in five and 10 bucks a month. And that was so, here's the organization. It was so effective that 2020, we had 13 candidates in Ohio beyond uncontested races where a Democratic candidate did not even have $5,000. The whole campaign. In 2022, in only five months, that 1,100 people provide enough money that not a single candidate running for the Ohio State House had under $5,000. We filled the difference. We went to the hardest to run places and said, we love that you're running. We know it's tough, but we want you to be able to knock on doors. We want you to have flyers. We want to have yard signs. We're here to help. And so now my goal is, because I'm always thinking long game, take that number to 2,000 or 3,000 or 4,000. And next time around, Give out more money, not at the top down, from, but the bottom up. Uh, there are other, uh, the, the middle, the, the, the swing candidates are getting more support, but to run everywhere, we have to support people running the toughest places. And so when I say we need to build an infrastructure that values running everywhere, that's what I'm talking about. If you go to blueohio.org and you're interested, I would love to have you join. We have a monthly call now, probably 100 people every call. We hear updates on the state house. We hear updates from candidates. We hear updates on issue one. So it's a community. It's not just a way to fund. But the heart of it is we are showing these candidates that have always been ignored, left by the wayside, even as they're running. No, no, no. We're the group that loves that you're running because we think that accountability you're bringing is key to a healthy democracy in Ohio. So that's one of that's one of many ways. And the good news is there is a grassroots infrastructure building that does value running everywhere. There's a group called Run for Something. There's a group called the States Project that it adopts state houses. There's things like Blue Ohio. It's not, and my main message in my second book is those are viewed as sort of side things. And what I'm saying is their core mission, once you see what the real battle is, we got to scale them up and we got to make them central. I had a call from Kamala Harris the other day about my book. She saw me on TV and I want to get her the list of organizations and say the way we lift them up, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. But we certainly have to take things that are working and scale them up very quickly and mainstream them. Okay, our last question is from Katie. Hey, David, my battery's dying any minute. Um, but first, that list that you're going to give to Kamala or anybody else, uh, put Democrats abroad on that yeah. list. You're, you're, if you by want. the way, <laughs> you're another part of that thing that I think is still too viewed as in the side and it needs to be core. I completely agree with that. We send votes home to every state, every congressional district, and we're working on all of them. Um, I first want to tell you that my mother, who's now 96, you may remember signing a book for her, and I look forward to the new book. But I want to come back to August 8th because that's what we're doing right now. We are trying. We have been emailing, texting, using social media. But right now we're trying to phone bank all of our Ohio members. We awesome. intend to be the margin. How close is it going to be? Can we win? And is the overseas vote going to provide that margin of victory? 
and nice to um, see you. It, yeah, good, great to see you. So uh, Pam just put in techforcampaigns.org is also a good group. Funny you put that down, Pam, because I include, I list as many groups as I could in the book. And that's another one I mentioned. Uh, they are doing great work and, um, and, and we, we need to give them more love too. By the way, I also, I put in the book that I think precinct organizing is the lowest hanging fruit in terms of how we can improve. I also, have, as I've said to you guys in the past, Democrats abroad is the same thing. There's such an untapped universe. Um, issue one, not surprisingly, they were able, again, LaRose is the worst. They were able to write some very Orwellian language that I think does stack the deck if you know nothing about the issue when you show up and vote for it. So polls have it at about 50-50 right now, I think partly because the language, I mean, if you showed up to a ballot and knew nothing and it said, this will elevate the Ohio Constitution, you'd think, well, that sounds good, I'll vote for it. We have to obviously message well. From what I've seen, and this is the good news, and this is where all your help can make a huge difference. And by the way, what I'm trying to do, and you can help with this too, don't just have Ohioans do this. This needs to be the next Wisconsin Supreme Court race, the next Kansas referendum. We need to nationalize this thing because if it happens in Ohio, if they raise it to 60%, they'll bring it everywhere. So it's coming next in other states if they do it here. And so everyone that can get involved, and I was in rolling out this book, I was in New York two weeks ago, I was in Boston. The Boston people had done a phone bank on issue one to Ohio the week before. The New York people have been doing postcards. So we got to nationalize it. Um, and the, the truth is when we do, the messaging, as someone said, is very strong. One, Dobbs is a 60%, uh, 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 the right to choose is close to a 60% issue in Ohio. If people have this in their mind linked, to an attack on reproductive rights, it really gets support. Number two, it when it's when it's cast in the bro the proper context of we have the most corrupt state house in the country, which is true. Our former speaker will be sentenced to years in prison to, on Thursday, and that this also is about protecting politicians and lobbyists from the people. That's very powerful, and the broader message about how it offends the basic notion of one person, one vote, because in this case, 41% of, of Ohioans would trump 59% of Ohioans. That All that messaging is very strong. And that was the message also that won this thing in Arkansas. They tried this in Arkansas, it lost 60-40. They tried this in North Dakota and lost 60-40. When people understand what it is, they're quite offended by it. So we can win. The The language though is, is favorable enough to them that if we don't inform people, it could lose. If we do inform people and people who are concerned about abortion rights show up, we can win. So everything is, your efforts to turn people out could be the difference because it's going to be low turnout. And if we pop our turnout like they did in Kansas, and I'm sure you guys were part of that too, it can be all the difference. Wow. And by the way, if your callers do not need to be Ohio voters, I, it this is literally calling into regular Ohio Democrats for the most part and saying, did you know about this crisis election? Please show up. Most people right now, when we have, I hear this anecdotally all the time, volunteers are knocking on doors. And the truth is, as much as we insiders know about it, most people have no idea that it, it's happening. So I don't, call if, I don't care where you're calling from. A phone call that simply says what's happening, your postcard. If they ask if you're from Massachusetts, say, yeah, I'm so alarmed from Massachusetts. I'm trying to help you in Ohio. Who cares? Just get the word out. Wow. David, 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 you've given us a lot to think and act on. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to raffle off your books that you generously donated to us. Uh, can you hang out for a minute or do you need to go? I need to go in one second, but I can stay for, for a little bit. All right, Miguel, take it away. Okay. Well, people, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the time has come for the raffle. So, so who wants one of the books that David has graciously donated to us? Okay, are we ready? Are we fired up? Um, I'm ready. So, okay, so Angela, Jeff, can I have a drum roll, please? And pull out the first name. Okay, uh, I can't do a drum roll, but I can pull out the first name. Let's see who it is. Oh, the first name is Neil Lopes. Uh, I can't remember where she is, but we'll find her. I don't think she's on the call today. 
but she did donate to help our phone banking. So thank you very much, Nina. All right. Okay, congratulations uh, to the person who won. So that is a signed copy of David's book. Thank you, David, again. And thank you, uh, the person who won and everybody else. So now let's go to the second book and to another lucky winner. So okay. uh, I guess we have a drum roll. <laughs> Can you hear this drum roll? No. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> <It's fun. laughs> oh. oh. Andy Stites from Norway. Who? Second person. Okay, congratulations to congratulations. the person in Norway who won yeah. uh, the book. Uh, the books will be in the mail for you eventually, or very <laughs> shortly. Now, um, you know, one of the things in Democrats Abroad, we have three big donors, uh, country committees that, that, that those are, um, France, Democrats Abroad France, Democrats Abroad Germany, Democrats Abroad UK. They have a big Ohio population. So we thought we think it's a good idea to award each one of them a copy so they can push this campaign even higher amongst their members. So just today, two of our top donors have withdrawn from a pro, from the prize draw. So we have books to send that, send to them. Do you have any objections? No. Okay. No, see. no objections, Miguel. They pushed us over the top and made this thing. Yeah, they made Good it happen. To go now instead of like in September. So okay, so seeing none, seeing like the A's have it, the major country committees will get that book will be coming your way with a major thanks from Ohio uh, for backing up this effort. So that's it for the prize draw. Uh, Jeff, back to you. Oh, I didn't know I was on. I just got a drum out, but I guess I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh really God. all I knew to do. I'm sorry. Um, I, I missed my cue. Um, can someone take my next part, please? Okay. All right. I will take your last part. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks so much. Um, Thank you so much, David, for coming. And please remember to register for the August special election in Ohio. Um, the, the last date to register is July 10th. And if you haven't already, tell your friends and family in Ohio about this crucial election. Overseas voters can go to votefromabroad.org to request an absentee ballot. The ballots are scheduled to be have been sent out, starting sending out on the 23rd. So fill out your no vote and return it ASAP. Ohio ballots can only be returned by postal mail or courier service. If you will be voting in Ohio, early voting begins on July 11th and the election day is August 8th. Um, thanks so much, everybody. Have a great, a great rest of your day, wherever you are. Thanks, thanks everybody. Keep doing what you're doing. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.